Cool. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm here to talk about GoKit, which um, is sort of a toolkit for microservices. And I'll explain what all that means now. But before I get into the details, um, I guess I'll start with a story here. Uh, it's sort of the origin story of the project and a little bit of the motivation. So late last year, I was working for SoundCloud. And we were one of the first companies that was using Go publicly. And to great success, actually. Um, we did a lot of infrastructure in Go. Our, our sort of platform as a service was written in Go, sort of a Heroku clone. Uh, we were using a uh, form of containers back before Docker was even a company. And uh, we did a lot of business stuff, business logic, application logic in Go as well. So our search infrastructure was powered by Go. Um, our monitoring product called Prometheus, which is now a very large open source project, was uh, written in Go from day one. And there were a couple other smaller things kind of scattered throughout the company. And by any metric, Go was a, a really big success. Um, the Go services were smaller and faster than their counterparts in Ruby, for example. Um, and uh, they were very reliable, um, very easy to deploy, uh, consumed fewer resources, all the good stuff. So that was great. But what I was noticing as my sort of time at that company uh, went on was that Go was not uh, being chosen for work uh, for, for new projects and new services as much as I would have thought it should have been. Um, and that made me sad, right? Not only because I really let go as a language, but because I think in a lot of ways it's the perfect language for this kind of work. And by that I mean these sort of business logic services, so like a user service or an authentication service. If you saw um, Matt's talk at, at Mondo Bank uh, previously today, all the sort of stuff that he's doing, the, the business logic stuff that, that he does, um, whether it's uh, you know like uh, um, transactions or um, uh, sending SMS messages or connecting to Foursquare and getting information about vendors, this sort of like core business stuff, um, to me, it's the perfect. Uh, Go is a perfect language for this sort of thing. But at SoundCloud, we, we weren't really doing it. And Go was in many ways losing to other languages, specifically Scala. Um, and so I, I, was, I was sad about that. And I did a bit of research into why. And um, what I came up with was kind of the, the motivation for, for GoKit. Um, before I get into that too much, I, I want to maybe put SoundCloud in, in a context. SoundCloud is one of these companies that uh, I'm going to call a modern enterprise. And so uh, what do I mean by that? Modern enterprise, I think, is an important type of company uh, or organization. Uh, it's something that is almost certainly all of these things, at least most of them. Uh, organizations that are tech-oriented, meaning like we care about the latest in the, in the tech industry, we uh, have a vested interest in, in, in good new technology. Uh, it's probably consumer focused, just because that's where a lot of the financial incentives are aligned right now. Uh, it's definitely growth driven, meaning it's incentivized to uh, grow very quickly and it has to deal with the problems that come with being growth driven. That's a, a core sort of business requirement. Uh, just maybe as a historical accident, these organizations tend to be VC funded, which come with their own set of like incentives. Um, the modern enterprise, as I define it, is a company that is sizable. It's probably at least 50 engineers, maybe up to 1,000 or more. This is an important point because it means that uh, the type of engineering that goes on there, it has to, uh, it's, it's beyond some minimum threshold where the, the process is important. And the, uh, the way you communicate with your peers and the way you structure your code, it becomes important in ways that if you're maybe five or 10 people, you can get by with uh, less strict process and you can get by with perhaps not best practices. So it has to be sizable, I think. And uh, again, just sort of a historical accident, but it seems that these organizations are microservice oriented. So they run sort of a microservice architecture or they're migrating to one. So for examples of these companies, um, you might look at Google and Amazon. For me, these companies are too big. Uh, they kind of do their own thing. And so I don't really like to consider them. But if you come down the stack and maybe you consider uh, a company about the size of Facebook, uh, they're maybe too big, but they're starting to get to what I'm talking about. Uh, Twitter is a great example. Um, then kind of coming down in size, Netflix, companies like Spotify, SoundCloud, Halo. 
Uh, Etsy would be another good example, except they run a monolith. So the thing about these companies is they hit most of these bullet points that I, that I uh, enumerated. And um, they are important, I think, because they tend to drive conversations in our industry. They tend to drive the technical discussion, so to speak. And um, if Go is going to be a success as a language and as sort of a technological movement, I want to argue that it's important that we have representation in these organizations and that these organizations are able to adopt Go and that they're able to have success stories. These companies are incentivized to take technical risks, I will argue. Um, and when those risks pay off, these organizations blog about it and they, they uh, push those like successful bets forward. And I would argue that things like microservices are a product of exactly this cycle. Things like DevOps or immutable infrastructure or any number of buzzwords, maybe even like containers actually, uh, came out of this sort of process. So again, if Go will succeed, I think we need to have representation in these organizations and we need to have sort of a success story coming out of them. What Go has already is a lot of what I would say are small scale kind of technical success stories. So you'll see plenty of blog articles that say, we, wrote, we rewrote our API services in Go and we saw you know, like a 10x drop in, in, in resource and a 10x improvement in latency and this is great, right? Uh, but we've got a lot of these now. What I want to argue is that what we now need at this next sort of evolution of, of the growth of the language is larger scale sort of business success stories. I want to see companies say, we switched to Go, and as a result, we raised 100 million Series C. Or we switched to Go, and as a result, um, we went from not profitable to profitable for these reasons. Um, and I think if we get those stories, we're going to build a lot of credibility um, among companies that are big, among companies that are small and growing. And I think that, more than anything at this sort of stage in our growth, is what Go needs to capture attention. It needs this sort of credibility. And so this was kind of the, uh, the scene for GoKit. Let me take a step back. Uh, this was at a conference called uh, Golang UK, I guess, not too long ago. I don't know, did anybody see this talk on the internet or in person, perhaps? Um, Dave said that, uh, one thing that was apparent to him was that uh, the early adopters set the tone for community in ways that are often difficult to change. And this resonated with me as well. Not only is Go in this like inflection point of like adoption in terms of like organizations and technology, but it's also at this point where we're getting a lot of new people. And maybe many of you are new. Actually, I'm curious. How many of you have like been programming Go for less than like six months? Yeah, that's crazy. That's crazy to me. And that's great, right? This is exactly what we need to see, I think. But with this like influx of new people, which is only going to increase in terms of like acceleration, uh, we need to have uh, the, what I think are like patterns and best practices and like uh, established ways of doing common things. Because precisely these things are what set the tone for the next sort of generation of growth. Okay, so I'd like gave you all these like ideas about what I think we need. And if you take them all together, you get what I think uh, is the motivation for GoKit. Uh, GoKit is something that uh, is like a toolkit. I might even say a framework, although that's kind of a loaded word. Uh, it's packaging together all of these ideas of um, uh, a set of idioms, best practices for these like modern, organiza or modern enterprise organizations that are going to allow them to uh, do business logic uh, application level programming uh, in the large for a lot of people and answer a lot of common questions that they may have and they may not even know that they have yet, but they're gonna need to answer eventually. And coming back to SoundCloud, I think this was the reason that Go was sort of losing to Scala was that uh, Go didn't have answers to these sorts of questions, these like questions about uh, how do I build a robust sort of set of microservices that are, are safe and reliable and uh, deal with errors in a good way. Um, 
in Scala, there were answers for these questions. And largely at SoundCloud, we use the, the Twitter finagle stack to answer many of these questions. There are other alternatives. Uh, there's a Netflix of, uh, uh, ribbon and Hystrix and like all these like federation of things. Uh, also Java and Scala. The JVM is really well represented here. And I think as a result of this like uh, mature library support, uh, the JVM is really well represented at these modern, organiza modern enterprise organizations. So what I want to do with GoKit is to provide a viable alternative. I want to say, uh, if you use GoKit, we have answers to these questions that have answers in the JVM world. And as a result, you can use Go for this sort of business level application logic. And um, I think if we have answers to those questions, people are going to be able to hop on board. They're going to see the other advantages that Go has that make it, in my view, and I hope many of your view, uh, really a superior language for large-scale programming, programming in big teams, uh, not only um, in the sense that it uses less resources and it's faster and all this stuff, but that it's nicer to work with on a day-to-day -day basis, that it's easier to get up to speed, easier to make changes, easier to have code that grows with grace, all these lovely things. So that's what I want GoKit to do. And that's sort of the motivation. And so this was something that popped into my head, I guess, at the beginning of this year, end of last year. Since then, I've been kind of toiling away with a small group of contributors, um, producing some packages, producing some idioms. And uh, now it's to a point where it's usable, I would say, uh, sort of in an alpha way. And what I want to do with this talk is show you what this looks like at the moment um, very didactically. So um, basically what I want to do is um, uh, give you a, a sense of what GoKit is, what it provides, and then let's, in this talk, build a service using all the GoKit idioms, see how it feels. Okay, so GoKit, what are its goals? Like I said, make Go a first class citizen for business logic, application logic, I'll use these terms interchangeably. Uh, it should support what is effectively a microservice architecture. Um, I'm not saying we won't support ar other architectures in the future, but this is predominantly the architecture that the organizations I'm targeting use, so I want to support that first and foremost. Likewise, we kind of settle on the idea of RPC as the messaging pattern, not to say that we can't have uh, publish, subscribe, or like message bus patterns in the future, but uh, the majority of people that I see uh, are going to be using this pattern, so let's focus and get a good story there. Uh, critically, we want to work in mixed environments, which means I don't want you to have to buy into GoKit wholesale in order to get use out of it. Almost certainly, uh, these organizations that we're targeting are big. They're not going to switch over their infrastructure at once. They're not going to change how they do things uh, in a single day. So GoKit services should be able to kind of be deployed into an existing architecture and be responsible citizens in that, uh, in that infrastructure. And kind of getting back to this idea of community GoKit should provide these best practices, idioms, examples, patterns for how you should do microservice services, how you should do circuit breaking, how you should do distributed systems, distributed programming. Um, and it should be sort of a, a learning tool more so than a turnkey solution. So getting to non-goals, um, at the moment at least, I don't want GoKit to be a turnkey solution. I don't want you to be able to say, this is a GoKit server, and I don't have to think about it. Um, we're not, in my view, in, in an industry, in the industry, we're not to a point where uh, all of our patterns are mature enough that we can do this sort of thing. Um, I want you to kind of think a little bit. And I want to give you, uh, with GoKit, like guide rails, say, like, uh, this is a pattern that works, but think about it, make sure it, it works in your infrastructure. Similarly, I don't want to require any specific component. Like, I don't want to say you have to use Zookeeper, you have to have a Zookeeper instance running to use this feature, or uh, you have to be using console to do your service discovery. Uh, as much as possible, I want to interact and uh, uh, work with whatever components, whatever operation stuff you already have deployed. Again, going back to the story that uh, we probably can't make you change the way you do things. We want to work in over time. Similarly, I don't want to have opinions about stuff that's outside of the domain of services. So GoKit doesn't really care how you do orchestration, whether you're copying binaries and like starting them with, uh, with Runit, or whether you're using Docker containers, it's all like fine. Uh, we don't care how you pass configuration. We would encourage you to do the 12-factor thing. Configuration is part of the environment, but you know it's kind of up to you. We won't have strong opinions here. <clears throat> 
and the, really the, the theme to, to these non-goals is we want to eliminate barriers to adoption. We want to say, if you have engineers in your modern enterprise organization who want to use Go and like can make a compelling case, we want to remove barriers that allow um, technical leads or like engineering managers to say no because um, we want to like demonstrate value. And this is all about eliminating barriers to demonstrating value. Okay. So let's build a thing. And I know many of you probably have laptops out. Uh, I want to encourage you to get your laptops out if you want to. Um, I'm going to be going through uh, the process of building a GoKit service kind of step by step. And if you want to follow along, please feel free. Um, so let's do it. OK. Uh, first, let's talk about the thing we're going to be building. And the thing is a service. What is a service? Is it a blue box? Yes. Also, it's other things. A service is like an entity, right? It's, it's a thing that stuff talks to and that probably it talks to other stuff. And already, with that stupid definition, we have a lot of requirements that fall out of that immediately. If there is a thing which is running in an infrastructure, then you need stuff to make that a good citizen. You need logging, right? You need metrics, and metrics not only at like the, the component level, like how much memory it's using, what the garbage collection times are, but metrics at the, at the business level, like how many requests have I processed, or even uh, how many daily active users have I seen in, in this instance, uh, in this instance of the thing. So all that's important. Um, when you start talking to other stuff, a lot of stuff becomes important. Like, uh, if you're talking to instances of something else, you need to have, it turns out, uh, a circuit breaking layer so that if one instance goes bad, you don't propagate that error through the rest of your infrastructure in a way that you can't predict, right? Um, you probably need rate limiting if you're dealing with services that are fragile or the third party services. Um, when you're even talking about finding other stuff, you need, uh, you need ideas of, of service discovery to figure out how or, or what the other instances are and you need a uh, concept of load balancing to distribute load according to some heuristics. All this stuff is like critical and uh, very hard to come up with by yourself if you don't already know the problems associated with it. Similarly, and again, I think Matt talked to, uh, touched on this in his talk, uh, when you have a federation of this constellation of services that are talking to each other, uh, you very quickly get lost in the noise when a request comes in and you like don't know what happens. So you need, uh, Probably, at beyond a certain size, you need something like request tracing. This is a Zipkin or a Dapper or an AppDash or a Phosphor, some sort of system that can track a request as it traverses your network of services. And um, that's really tedious to get going, as it turns out, um, if you do it from scratch. So this is like a pretty good overview of the sort of stuff GoKit is going to be uh, providing or like helping you with. And it's the sort of stuff that I want to walk everybody through today. But this is all sort of external to your service, right? In, in this diagram, the service is just a blue box. So let's like open that box a little bit and see what's inside. And this is the model that I'm going to like advocate for. Um, it's not necessarily the only way to do it, but it, it turns out it's, it's helpful. So you can envision this as sort of like an onion. And at the center of the onion, the stuff you really care about is your business logic. And if you could have your druthers, this is all you would care about, right? This is all you would write. You wouldn't spend any time thinking about other stuff. Um, and that's the core of any service. It turns out there's a bit more that you probably should care about. Like at the business level, um, you should care about metrics like uh, how many uh, bank transactions you're processing per second or something like that. And then even the layer above, the like, first derivative of that, like how many, how many active users you're seeing on a, on a daily or monthly basis. This is stuff that you probably need to care about as a business. And um, that really, I, I want to emphasize, only you are capable, as, as, a, as a programmer for your organization, only you are capable of really making meaningful, writing meaningful code to, to analyze and to emit. But I want to draw this line sort of at, at that point and say everything else above that, all these other things in the other, in the other diagram that I showed you, uh, you don't really care about. You know it's got to be right and it's got to be there, but um, you're kind of willing to be hands off and say, uh, I'm going to cede responsibility for this, uh, for this stuff to uh, a trusted third party, which is what I hope GoKit is. And so that's stuff like basic connectivity, and that includes um, service discovery and like maintaining connection pools and that sort of thing to all your dependencies. Um, 
wrapping that as this idea of safety. So if one of the instances goes down, how do you deal with that? There are correct answers to this question and there are incorrect answers to this question. Um, so we want to solve that problem for you. Then there's a concept of um, metrics at this level. So this is uh, service level metrics like uh, how many active connections do I have right now to this particular thing? That's important for operations people. It's important if you're running an infrastructure. Your business logic doesn't really care about that, but your operations people do. And then even beyond that, there's this idea of a transport, which is how do you actually uh, uh, talk from one thing to another? And there's many equally valid answers here. Um, GoKit focuses on RPC, point-to-point -point RPC. Uh, but even within that uh, broad umbrella, there's a lot of ways to do it. You can do uh, JSON over HTTP, you can do gRPC, you can do NetRPC, um, Avro, Thrift, there's so many ways to do it. And GoKit, like, again, eliminating barriers to adoption, we want to be able to support all of these possible ways of doing things uh, as best we can. Okay, a lot of explanation. So let's get started, and let's start at the inside of that onion, right? Let's talk about our business logic. Um, let's come up with some dumb service. We'll call it string service. And what we want to do, what we're going to aim to do, is define our service in the language of Go, right? In, in using Go primitives and Go constructs. And I think a great abstraction for a service is indeed the Go interface. So what we've done here is taken a, uh, something we call a string service. We define it as an interface. A string service is anything which provides you these two uh, uh, operations. So an uppercase operation that returns a string and an error, and a count operation that just returns an, an integer. I hope it's pretty clear what we expect these things to do. Um, I want to be totally clear here and say that this definition is what we're going to call the, the business or the application domain. Uh, this is the stuff you care about. So here we have kind of a, a silly little implementation of a string service which is uh, just an empty struct because there's no state here, really. Um, uppercase just does strings to upper. We uh, manufacture this error, just so I can show you how error propagation works, but if the string is empty, we'll say that's, that's an error condition in our business domain. Uh, and count is just returning the length of the string. So in the business or application domain, we have this business or application logic. And wouldn't it be great if that's all we had to do? Okay, so that's our service definition. But now we sort of take a step back and we say, okay, how do we, how do we turn this into a service? Uh, GoKit does RPC, and RPC is in the domain of request and response. And it turns out the abstraction that works here is uh, that we use request and response objects. So for each sort of method, for each RPC that we have, we need to define a request object and a response object. And at the moment, um, this is sort of a manual process, sort of a didactic tutorial, so I'll go through it very uh, sort of long form. You can understand what's happening. Uh, request, uppercase request, is just something that uh, has a single S string. Uh, the response has the response and an error. Um, same thing with count, very straightforward. I put JSON tags on here because eventually we're going to serialize this over JSON, but if you used a different uh, serialization library or a different transport, you might not need to do that. Okay, so this is a little bit of boilerplate, but so far so good. Um, now we get to kind of the meat of GoKit. Uh, GoKit is built around an RPC abstraction called an endpoint. And an endpoint is a function that takes a context and a request interface uh, empty interface, and returns a response as an empty interface and an error. Uh, I'd like to make a distinction here. This error is an error in the uh, sort of endpoint or transport domain. It's not a business logic error. So back here, uh, the string service uh, uppercase method can return an error. That's not the same error as this error. So it's sort of like when you make an HTTP call, the, the client.do, right, that can return an error, but that type of error is distinct from like a, a, a 500 error, right? The 500 error is an error equals nil, but the, the error is reported in the response object. So just a distinction there. So this is the fundamental like building block, the abstraction. Uh, what we need to do then is convert each of our methods to endpoints. And the way we do that is with sort of an adapter uh, function. Here we have two. Uh, 
Uh, one is a make uppercase endpoint, which takes a string service and returns an endpoint. And you can see all it really does is um, convert the request uh, that's coming in to the type we expect, uh, invoking the service uppercase and then returning a response. Same thing down here. And in functional programming world, this is, I think, called lifting. So what we're doing here is lifting um, a service type into the domain of the endpoint, into the endpoint domain. So from the business domain into the endpoint domain. And this corresponds to a corresponding uh, like, like a layer in the onion, right? We're just lifting from one, one domain to another. OK, so far so good. Bit more boilerplate, that's all right. Oops. So the endpoint is like a universal adapter. From any service, you can convert to an endpoint. And then from an endpoint, you can convert to sort of any transport. So in our example, let's pick JSON over HTTP. We could do anything. We could do gRPC. We could do any, any sort of wire level transport. This is just easy to demonstrate. So for JSON over HTTP, GoKit gives you some helpers. Um, this helper is a server that takes some stuff. And one of the things it takes is the endpoint that it will eventually call. So this thing implements HTTP handler. And it, the way it does that is it decodes a request uh, from, decodes a, a, a uppercase or a count request from the HTTP request, invokes the underlying endpoint, and then returns a response. Um, pretty straightforward. I hope, that's, I hope that's clear. We have two of these because we have two RPC methods. <laughs> um, here's what the decode and encode methods look like. Again, it's pretty straightforward-ish. Um, decoding a re uh, uppercase request is just, uh, in our case, deserializing via JSON, putting it into this uh, uh, endpoint domain, or RPC domain request object, and then returning that. Uh, same thing for count. And then encoding a response is generic because it's just a JSON encoder. OK, so that's it. And this is our func main. Um, we create a background context for our service. We create an instance of our, uh, our string service. We create these two handlers. Uh, we mount them at the right points on our HTTP muxer. And then we, uh, we run the server. So let's see if this works. It's running. I should be able to, yeah. So everyone's familiar with curl, I guess. So if we run that, uppercase, all good. Count, I hope that's nine. Yep. OK, cool. So there's our service. Um, but this black screen kind of gives away our first problem, which is that we're not really logging anything. So it's kind of useless, certainly not production ready. So let's. Um, Let's add some logging. A service that doesn't log anything is useless indeed. Let's, let's add uh, logging with our GoKit's package log. And there's a lot of ways you could do this, right? You could put it directly in the HTTP handler. You could put it um, uh, when you're doing the endpoint conversion or any number of things. Um, but it turns out these aren't really nice and composable. Uh, what we want to do is utilize what I think is the true power of GoKit, which is middlewares, or uh, it's also known as the decorator pattern. We talked about this a little bit. There were several talks about this at uh, GopherCon in Denver. So uh, here's the log package's uh, logger interface. We strongly believe that structured logging is important, so that's what that implements. And uh, here's something called a middleware. So within the endpoint package, um, you, we have a type that uh, is called middleware. It takes an endpoint, and it returns an endpoint. And in this function, um, you can do anything. And what we're going to do now is write uh, middlewares that do logging. So here's one way to do it. We could write an endpoint logging middleware that closes over a logger and returns a middleware. The middleware is a function that takes an endpoint and returns an endpoint. And that, in turn, uh, an endpoint is a function that takes a context and a request returns a response and an error. I see this like three stack of function uh, uh, types, three level of indentation. That's very common in uh, Go decorator or Go middlewares. And in the inside, we have access to all these things. We have access to the request context and the request object. 
we have access to like the next endpoint that we want to call, like the next layer of the onion. And we have access to the logger that we want to log stuff to. And so when we're in this like method body, we can log the, whatever we want. This is the time that things begun. Uh, when, we can, when it's done, we can log how, how long it took. And then we invoke the next, uh, the next uh, endpoint. But this isn't great because at this level of abstraction, we don't have access to the parameters of our function. We just have this, we just have this endpoint, which takes this opaque request object and returns it an opaque response object. So that might be fine, but it might not be. We probably want to be able to log what the string is that came in and what our response was. So to do that, we can um, instead create something sort of like an application middleware. And remember, we've defined our service as an interface. So pretty much anything that implements that interface can be used as sort of a middleware. And this is how, um, this is perhaps one way to do it, and this is how I would say we can do it. Uh, we can define a new type called a logging middleware, which is a struct that contains the stuff that we want to use. In this case, it's a logger and the next service that we want to call. And then we can implement the uppercase method in this case. And the uppercase method is the same type definition. Uh, we defer this function that invokes the log with all the details that we care about. Um, and then we just, uh, when we're done with that, we, we call the, the uppercase method of uh, the enclosed string service and then return. And then this is a nice little idiom too. Um, using these named result parameters, we can have access to them in the, um, deferred function without having to like, do anything super crazy uh, in the call stack there. So that's cool. And you can imagine this is the uppercase method. You can imagine the count works exactly the same. Um, cool. So that's logging. That's a really nice way. And like, I want to sort of emphasize that by doing this, we've isolated the concern of logging to a single middleware. And that's super important. That means like, if we want to change our logging, uh, we just kind of poke at it here, and we don't uh, mess with anything else. We don't mess with uh, an instrumentation layer. We don't mess with the core business logic. Because the, these concerns are like, they aren't actually coupled, right? Um, we care about it, but when we're adapting business logic, we don't want to like potentially screw up our, the, the, the way we do logging, uh, the, a logging parser or something like that. So um, this is cool and important, I think. And it turns out that it makes for a really nice and readable and robust code. Okay, so similarly to logging, um, we want to do instrumentation. Instrumentation is very closely related to logging in, in my view. Um, logging is always for stuff that would be actionable. So you would log errors, you would log requests to be consumed by a system later. But for normal like uh, uh, performance metrics or, or, or performance information about a service, this is in my view the domain of, of instrumentation or for me, uh, for GoKit, package metrics. And so this means, uh, well, our, our package metrics provides interfaces for instrumenting code. And we have settled on sort of the, the basic three, which is counters, uh, gauges, and histograms. And so a counter is something that always goes up. You might say uh, the number of requests served by this instance. A gauge is something that fluctuates, like maybe the current number of Go routines. Uh, and then a histogram is something that has observations. The most obvious use of a histogram, I guess, would be the duration of each request, which you would record at the end of the request. Uh, but you can use histograms for other things, too, anything that uh, has values that occur in a range. So we provide these interfaces, which can be implemented by a number of instrumentation systems. Uh, the most obvious one is like XVAR, right? So go standard library XVAR. Um, you can couple these interfaces with uh, a utility package and then export them to XVAR uh, and, and make them readable in that way. Uh, we have exporters for Graphite and StatsD and uh, this common stuff. And um, we also have exporters for Prometheus, which I mentioned before. It's a really great system if you're spinning up a new uh, organization or a new project and you need monitoring or metrics, you should definitely uh, look at Prometheus from the get-go. It's, it's really great. Okay, so in the same way we built this logging middleware, we can build an instrumentation middleware, an instrumenting middleware. We close over the things we care about. In this example, let's say we care about uh, the number of requests we've served. 
the latency that they have taken, and then we can say the result of all of the count invocations can be a histogram. So we can see how big, how long are the strings that people are sending to us, and we can graph that with like upper 95th percentile and stuff like that. Maybe that's interesting. I don't know. It's all business domain stuff. And here it's the same deal. Um, we re-implement our uh, string service, except at the beginning we have this function that um, performs these uh, instrumentation invocations. And here there are some fields. The, the, the parameterization of um, each of the calls is important. It's kind of a detail. You can get into it later if you want. Uh, but then we add one to the request count for uppercase, and then we observe how long it's taken. And all this information gets sort of aggregated and shipped to some third-party monitoring service. Um, so that's fine. I want to emphasize here that, like, again, this is the, the concern that we're dealing with here is instrumentation. And that's all this function does. It's only concerned with instrumentation and then passing off to the next layer. And I think that's really nice and really elegant. And I want to encourage that pattern. OK, so uh, we've built these things. Now we need to wire them into our service. And here's how we do it. Uh, here's one way to do it. We create a SVC uh, string service, which is the interface type, crucially. Uh, first, we assign it to the implementation, the core implementation that doesn't do any of these things. And then in turn, we assign it to uh, sort of a wrapping, an onion layer of middleware that does the thing we care about. So the first thing we'll do is we'll wrap it with a logging middleware. And then in turn, we'll wrap that with an instrumenting middleware. The order kind of doesn't matter, you know, but um, maybe it does for other things. As it's kind of drawn here, it's very declarative and maybe a little bit verbose, but that's very much by design. There's no way to get confused about what's happening here. And especially in more complex services, you want this property. You want your funk main to be a little bit verbose, but like very clear, bang, 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 this is what is being wired up in the object component graph. And um, no spooky action at a distance, no magic, no, um, no, no stuff that's happening as a side effect of importing a package or of calling a constructor or anything like this, or at least minimize this kind of stuff. Very important. OK, so now we have our new func main. Same start as before, except now we have this logger object. Um, we have this new uh, SVC, which is what we just described, this sort of onion layer stuff. Same handlers, same mounting. And we'll do a little bit of logging down here at the bottom. And just to prove to you that it's all right, um, we have our little first log message. And I can hopefully call the same thing. Yep, still 9, still capitalized. Hooray. Come back here. And we see all this stuff being invoked. Uh, the count method, here's our input. Here's a re response value, how long it took. Likewise. Uh, a little bit faster there. A little bit faster on the count. OK, cool. So far, so good. So it's still kind of a contrived example, because I guess very few services are going to be able to be totally self-contained. A service probably needs to call other services to do its job. And um, this is a, a really uh, a tricky part of any microservice architecture. So as a demo, let's proxy. Let's say we're going to proxy our uppercase requests to another destination. Um, conceptually, that might look like this. We might say, when we're constructing our uppercase endpoint, if we've decided to proxy, then we'll construct it in a way that, rather than uh, calling our local like implementation of the service, we're going to call out to some other service somehow. Otherwise, we're just going to do things normally. Um, so that works, and that, that, that conceptually is fine. But then we run into similar problems that we had initially when we want to log and instrument the, the invocation of that proxy. Um, we don't have access to uh, the parameters when they go out and come back, because we're in the endpoint domain in this, in this place. We, we're dealing with this endpoint.endpoint. .endpoint. So uh, instead, let's fall back to this middleware idea, and let's write a proxying middleware for our string service. Um, this is a little bit interesting. Uh, we're going to have this proxy middleware struct. It's going to have a context, which uh, is uh, the, the background context of our service. We're going to have the proxy is represented by an endpoint that we can call. And then we're going to embed a string service. This way, 
Uh, we only, like since we don't uh, define a, a count method, we're going to fall through as we saw uh, earlier in Andrew's talk, we're going to fall through and automatically call that string service to do the, the local stuff. But we are going to implement the uppercase method. Here it is. Um, we're going to translate our uh, business domain string and error types into the endpoint domain by uh, creating this uppercase request. And then the response we get is going to need to be cast to an uppercase response and then we return uh, the, the, the business domain string and error out the other side. Uh, okay, straightforward. Oops. Um, so I, I want to make a point here and say that uh, I, I just kind of used this uh, endpoint in the middleware. And in so doing, I've, I've effectively created a client side endpoint. It's exactly the same type as a, as a server side endpoint, but we use it in a different way. We use it to invoke rather than serve a request. And this is actually really powerful, and it comes in handy in a second. Um, OK. So that's all fine if your proxy URL is like a single service well known that we can pass as a flag. But in reality, that's probably not the case. We probably have a set of services, a set of string services, for example, um, that are dynamic and stateless and are scheduled and come up and come down and that need to be discovered and load balanced over and all this sort of stuff. So now we, we get into uh, GoKit's uh, package load balancer and, and service discovery stuff. So uh, there's three main concepts, I guess, to think of here. And bear in mind also, like, this is all about keeping the right level of abstraction. We want GoKit to work whether you're using console, etcd, zookeeper, uh, like Airbnb smart stack, uh, using a fixed set of addresses if you're a really small shop or even a single address and scale up to any, any other type of system. So we need these abstractions that work uh, no, matter, no matter what your infrastructure happens to be. And so here it is. Uh, we have one type called a publisher. A publisher is going to return, uh, it's a single method called endpoints, which returns a set of usable endpoints that all represent the same thing. So uh, remember, an endpoint is a single RPC. So in this case, our publisher would return uh, a set of things that implement the uppercase method. Not string service, but the uppercase method individually. Um, and anything can return that. So you can imagine a publisher being backed by console, uh, a publisher being backed by uh, a comma-separated list of, of strings or something like that. Okay, so that just gives you like the current state. If I want to make an uppercase request, I can use any of these instances, any of these endpoints. Okay, and then the next layer up is we want to have this concept of a load balance. We want to say, given this set of endpoints, how do I pick which one to use? And there's a couple strategies here. GoKit ships with a couple of them. You can pick randomly. That's kind of fine, actually, in a lot of cases. Uh, you can do a sort of a round robin thing. If you know a bit more about the endpoints, like healthiness, or like um, if you start tracking in a histogram maybe uh, the average latency, then you can pick like the fastest one or the least recently used or something like this. Uh, all this sort of logic could be um, wrapped up into the concept of a load balancer. And again, a load balancer is an interface that uh, yields a single endpoint. And the implementation would probably wrap a publisher and then keep some internal state as to how to, uh, how to pick the next endpoint, basically. Um, and then the final thing is what I call a retry. It's basically a way of, of converting uh, a load balancer, which is something that yields an endpoint, into something that implements an endpoint. So a load uh, a retry, excuse me, is something that's going to say, uh, I have this load balancer. I've, I've probably closed over this load balancer. Um, I am going to implement an endpoint, meaning I'm going to allow people to just send a request to me, and I'm going to handle all the details of, of, of uh, picking via the load balancer which request to send to and um, getting the response back and then, and then serving it back up. And uh, my logic can include um, the sort of like resiliency stuff that turns out to be important. So if the first request fails, I can retry for a little bit and, and, and try to make that failure transparent in the client. So these three things, a, a publisher, a load balancer, and, a, and sort of a retry strategy combine to convert a set of, a, d a dynamic set of, of, of instances into a single callable endpoint. So that's what we'll see here. Um, Let's walk through them again. Publisher turns an up-to-date set of endpoints. So 
uh, perhaps you're using DNS SRV records to do, uh, to do your, your service discovery. Here's a constructor. And then um, critically, I just want to point out uh, a factory as a type that takes a, a host port string, so like uh, this host colon 32768 or whatever, uh, and it does the job of converting that string into a usable endpoint, typically by making a connection. That's all the factory does. OK. Load balancer chooses the next endpoint to use. Here's a random load balancer, straightforward. Um, and a retry wraps a load balancer, provides a single logical load balance endpoint with some degree of resiliency. OK. So let's go back to our uh, proxy, right? We have this proxying middleware. We've configured it so far with just a single like URL string. But in reality, we probably want to have um, uh, a set of them. A set of them are available. We want to use this like three, this this three stack to get a, a usable, resilient end endpoint. And so altogether now, here's probably what it would look like. Uh, let's say this is our string service DNS record. Uh, we want to refresh it every five seconds. We're going to use DNS SRV uh, publisher as described. We're going to use a, a round robin load balancer, and then um, we're going to say. Within 100 milliseconds, we're going to try up to three times to make a successful request. And um, that is going to be our uppercase proxy endpoint. And just for completeness sake, here's what our factory looks like. Given an instance string, we're just going to construct this URL. Very dumb. You probably wouldn't do that in, in, in practice. So now we have a client endpoint we can put into our proxying middleware. But we've forgotten something important. We've forgotten uh, that these things can fail. And we need to deal with that. Um, so we're de dealing with it at some level with the retry, but it would be nicer if when we detected failures, we didn't hammer that particular instance with uh, a lot of requests, and we didn't um, uh, uh, d put too many requests to the same randomly uh, or round robin chosen instance if we could avoid it. So what we want to do is use the safety components of GoKit, um, and we want to prevent these things from happening in the first place. So we have a couple of things. We have something called a circuit breaker. Has, has anyone heard of a circuit breaker? You kind of know what I'm talking about? Cool. That's great. So we provide um, yeah, a couple of different implementations of circuit breakers that you can uh, uh, use. Uh, and similarly, we have a, a rate limiter based on the token bucket uh, uh, algorithm. And what I want to point out here is that both of these things return middlewares and return endpoint middlewares. And this is like kind of maybe a concep conceptual thing. That's very important, I think. Uh, the concept of a circuit breaker, like, it doesn't care what the contents of your RPC is, right? It knows it needs to send this, this thing out here, and then it, and it, and it will succeed or it will fail. But uh, it doesn't care about the details. So that means that we can provide these implementations at the endpoint layer or at the transport layer and thereby compose very easily with any service and with any transport, with any, whether it's HTTP JSON or, or Thrift or whatever. Uh, it's, it's agnostic to that stuff. And a lot of GoKit's value add is at this endpoint layer, at this like uh, translation layer between the transport and your concrete business logic. And that's an important distinction. And that's what allows GoKit to have power, in my view. OK, so we have these two things. Um, we want to wire them in to our, uh, our load balanced service discovered uh, proxy, but it's important to do that to each individual instance that we find. So if one instance starts to go bad, we want to we want to break the circuit to that single instance rather than to like the aggregate of all the things. So here's how we do that: uh, we wire it into the factory, and so we um, change our factory uh, function. And the important part is down here when we create uh, the endpoint. We make a, a single like, like a proxy to that thing, and then we wrap it with consecutive middlewares that provide these nice safety features. So we do that in the factory. And then you can wire it together. And um, the important part here is that this proxying middleware is uh, sitting between the actual implementation and everything else. And remember, it only proxies, if, uh, it only proxies the uppercase method. So if I did this right. Yeah, let's do a little demo here. So we need to start. Um, you see, this one is going to proxy to localhost 8001, and it itself is sitting on 8002. So I need to start a string service on 8001. It's not proxying anywhere. And then I need to make a request to 
8002. So I do this right, cool. Same result, but this guy that I started in the background, 8001, he got the request just as normal. He computed it uh, because he's not proxying anywhere. He computed it locally, returned the result. And then we see here uh, the request hit this service, was proxied, and we see this one took seven milliseconds. Here it took two microseconds. And if we time this, we'll see probably, I guess, like, yeah, a little bit uh, uh, on the order of 10 milliseconds or so. Um, similarly, we can just do count. And we'll see count is not proxied, so we won't see anything on this side. We get the result immediately, and we see count here. OK, cool. So I want to emphasize, like, a lot of stuff has happened here, right? This is like a service discovered, circuit breaking, load balanced, rate limited, like all these lovely things that you actually need in large scale production um, kind of done for you. Like, it's a little bit verbose here, but a lot of stuff's happening behind the scenes. And what you see here is really just like straightforward. Uh, there's, there's no like tricks, really. Uh, it's, it's all just kind of one after the other, very declarative, very compositional. And I think that's really nice. And um, to get it to this point has been a bit of work, but I think it, it's, it's, uh, it's really clear and it's really a nice foundation to work with your, with your business logic. OK, how much time do I have, actually? Because there's a lot more I can go into, depending. Say again? Ten minutes. OK, cool. Um, so I'll just quickly skim through a couple of bonus sections, and we'll get to some que uh, question and answer time. Um, I didn't touch on request tracing. Uh, if you're not familiar, request tracing is like, uh, like a Zipkin or something, uh, a Dapper, AppDash. Basically, when a, when a request hits your infrastructure at the load balancer, you want to see all the other services it goes to before uh, it finally gets returned to the client. It's very similar to like the network graph if you load up your, your browser's uh, uh, inspection console or something like that. Um, GoKit has currently support for Zipkin, which is, like I guess, the most popular one. We're currently building support for AppDash, which is a similar product by SourceGraph. And um, I've just today learned that Phosphor, I guess, is a real thing, so I'll probably build support for that as well. Uh, the way this works is um, you have to set up, uh, every system is different. In, in Zipkin's case, you have to set up this idea of uh, a span factory, uh, something that makes this concept of a span. I won't get into details. And then you have to set up a connection to a collector, which is where you send this information when every sort of individual service request is done. And then once you set these things up, you have to kind of wire them in to your, uh, to your service. And you have to do that in two places, right? You have to do it both in the uh, sort of the endpoint domain. So when the request comes in, you need to like make some annotations, determine how long it took, and then when it's finished, you have to send it off. But the information that's coming in uh, that you have to pass through all the requests, like a, a request ID, that has to get translated from the transport domain to the endpoint domain. Um, and so we need. Uh, this sort of like, we provide helper functions to do it, but you have to wire it in in a correct way. Uh, maybe to demonstrate what I mean, um, in the transport domain, maybe it's HTTP headers. If you happen to be using HTTP, they're going to look like this. So we have to put them into the context object using a helper function. And then from there, we do all like the business logic y stuff and then send it out. Um, the reason it's important to do this and not like couple it directly to HTTP is because, in theory, of course, you can uh, use Zipkin across uh, if you have thrift clients, if you have HTTP clients. In theory, you could use it if you had uh, um, your own custom HTTP JSON. Uh, you, could, you could use the same Zipkin inf infrastructure if you're using NetRPC. So it's important to like, make these a little bit generic or like, uh, generalized, I should say. And so that's why that has to work that way. But we have support for it. Um, we're building out support for new systems uh, all the time. Um, that touched on this idea of threading a context object. If you don't know about context, please take a look. There's a great blog on blog.golang.org. Uh, a context object is effectively a way to move information between the layers of the onion as you go from one domain to another to another. And not only in one onion, not only in one service, but across service instances, across uh, a call graph as uh, a request traverses your infrastructure. Um, and it also provides a really nice way to set up cancelable uh, call hierarchies. Um, so maybe you want to do that actually in your service. Maybe you want to have the first argument of your service uh, be a context. Uh, 
Um, this is actually maybe quite useful. Uh, for example, if you need information like trace IDs, uh, if you uh, are l doing something long running and you need to respect cancellation requests from things above you, um, and maybe you're, you yourself are a very complex service with a complex call hierarchy that needs to be interruptible, uh, the context object is the right way to do that. Um, it also makes for nicer proxying middlewares because you don't need to insert that extra background context. So something to consider. Um, for the last bonus, really quickly, it might be useful if you have a lot of Go code in your infrastructure to create a client package to your service so that uh, each individual uh, uh, client of yours doesn't need to manually construct HTTP requests. So the way to do that is uh, you probably will create a, a client subdirectory in your service repo. Um, and in that, you will provide a constructor that combines perhaps a preferred transport like uh, Thrift or whatever. Uh, it automatically builds in GoKit safety middlewares like rate limiters if you want to ensure that an individual client doesn't like hammer you too hard. Um, and then you can also bundle um, your own sort of business domain analytics stuff you need to record with every call uh, sort of on both sides of that request. Um, it's possible to create these. Uh, I don't have quite enough time to show you one, but it's, it's, it's straightforward and maybe quite useful. Okay, conclusion. Uh, we have a lot of stuff to do still. Uh, it's all underway. We want to have support for all the popular load balancers, service discovery uh, systems. In package log, we're um, expanding that to work not only with like application logging to a text file or whatever, but also log structured sort of pipelines. So features for uh, like if, if you're building a Kafka system and you want to like push, uh, reliably push uh, log structured data uh, through, a, through a reporting pipeline or something like that, package log is a perfect, perfect tool for that job. Um, improving the, the tracing systems we support, improving the, the transports we support. Does anybody actually use Avro? Maybe I can just cross this off the list. Nobody? Nobody? Okay, forget it. We're not doing that anymore. Um, package transport, we want to do uh, sort of show how to do client support a little bit better with examples and that sort of thing. Uh, long term, we want tools to generate all this sort of boilerplate that I showed you, like the request and response objects and like the bindings that lift from endpoint to transport domain. That's all possible to be generated with a Go Generate tool. Uh, it's just uh, being worked on right now. And um, we want to support messaging patterns beyond just RPC. Of course, we know people use RabbitMQ and publish, subscribe, and all these like things, and we want to support that long term. We're just kind of focused on RPCs for the time being. So that's what's coming up. Uh, what I want from you, and this is kind of like the, the single call to arms, call to action, if you've already done something like this in your organization, um, behind closed doors with a, with a private repo, I want to hear from you, especially if you think I'm doing something dumb, because I don't know any, I don't know like what everybody else has done. Maybe these are anti-patterns. I don't think so, but if you know I'm doing something wrong, let me know. Um, similarly, if you need something like GoKit to convince your manager or tech lead to let you use Go, that's ex you're explicitly the person I'm trying to help. So reach out to me if I can help you build things, if I can implement something that you need, if I can write a feature that you need, I'm happy to do it. Um, yeah, and so this is some, some places to find us. Uh, we have a channel on the Gopher Slack, uh, hash GoKit, uh, and this is where you can file issues and get things uh, implemented if you need it. And um, yeah, so I just want to close and say like, I'm, I'm really excited that conferences like this are happening everywhere, that Go uh, is, is has all this momentum. We, we have a lot of things going for us. Um, so I want to capture that excitement. And I want to make Go like a really big success story. And I think like now is the inflection point. Now is the time for that. And I hope that GoKit is something that puts us in the right direction and is, uh, yeah, a stepping stone to even greater things. So with that, thank you. And I might have like one microsecond for talk for yeah. questions. Questions? Or something. Yeah. Any questions? Going once, going twice. Ah, uh, one in the uh, back. I can ask a question in the middle. Uh, when is production ready? <laughs> when or what? When. When. Um, that's a very good question. What does production ready even mean? Um, Depending on what you want, I'm going to set a flag in the sand and say uh, definitely end of the year, maybe a little bit before then, um, something like that, something like that time frame. Um, I was wondering, at the start, you said for the RPC, you have to define response and request objects. 
um, that seems like something that like code generation could do for you. And in general, any plans on exploiting code generation in the entire project more? Yeah, totally. Um, a lot of the boilerplate stuff we started with is absolutely uh, candidate for code generation. There's a, there's a branch, there's a pull request that's already doing this effectively. Um, not only request and response objects, but like a lot of these adapters. Um, and a guy by the name of Sasha is helping me with that. Um, it's just, it's about as complicated as you'd expect it to be, so it's taking a while and we're like iterating on it. But yeah, it's definitely, definitely planned. So what I'd hope is that at the end of the day, you can write your type string service interface and then run some utility that we package, and it automatically spits out a, uh, a rec rep.go file with all the requests and responses and the bindings and all this sort of stuff. So yeah, absolutely, that's where I want to end up. Any more questions? Okay, guess not. Thanks very much again. <laughs>